everyone. Uh, my name, as you all know, I'm sure, is Phil Dunn, and I am the representative here in Northern Ireland for European Mission Fellowship. I want to begin straight off by giving you the warmest of welcomes to our EMF Belfast Conference. It's so, so good to have each and every one of you here today. I know life is busy. Uh, Saturdays are precious, aren't they? And many of you will have sacrificed other things just so you can be here. And perhaps for some of you, this is your very first time coming along to the conference. And that always requires an extra effort, doesn't it? So thank you so much for being here with us. You've already encouraged my heart. And I know that you've encouraged the hearts of our missionaries uh, just by your presence. And we've been praying earnestly that in all we do today, we will be informed and inspired, that our churches will be strengthened, and that the cause of Christ here and abroad will advance. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce our special speakers for today. And as usual, we have a superb lineup. Uh, first up, we have Mihai Kisari. Mihai has traveled all the way from Moldova to be here. Uh, he's actually the very first Moldovan missionary we've ever been able to support as a mission in our 63-year history. So we are thrilled about that. This is also Mihai's very first time in Northern Ireland. And over the last week, he's been really enjoying all our lovely sunny weather. <laughs> No, he hasn't. Uh, in terms of family, Mihai is married to Irina. They have two lovely little girls, Delia and Elisa. And I know, Mihai, that you are missing them like crazy, and I'm sure they're missing you too. Uh, Mihai was born into a nominal Eastern Orthodox family. Uh, that's the dominant religion of this former Soviet Republic. But sadly, like many young Moldovans, he experienced a very challenging upbringing. However, even through these difficult circumstances, the Lord was working, and he wonderfully broke into Mihai's life when he was just 17 years of the age. And we're going to hear more about what is, I think, a very moving story of salvation a little bit later on. But fast forward to 2016, and Mihai and a few others, they felt stirred by the need for a church to be established in the capital city of Moldova, Chisinau. And so back in 2018, Mihai planted Imago Dei Baptist Church in a district of over 200,000 people with less than 2,000 believers. Now, the church is still fairly small. The challenges are many. But what they're doing in terms of evangelism and discipleship and training is so inspiring. There are camps packed with children, 90% of whom come from non-Christian families. There are discipleship groups with young men, young women grappling with God's word. There are conferences geared to helping other churches in the country embrace sound doctrine and so on and so on. So we've got lots to look forward to as we hear from you, Mihai. Thank you so much for being here, brother. Now, our second special speaker is our brother, Diego Lopes. Um, we're really delighted that Diego's here because he spent most of last night in Luton Airport. He only arrived at our home at about 2 o'clock this morning. So we are just drip-feeding him coffee today. And at 2 o'clock, we're going to drag him out and put him into the car. So hopefully, uh, he manages okay. Uh, Diego was brought up in a loving Roman Catholic family in his native Brazil, but came to know the Lord at just 10 years of age through the witness of a friend. And the years passed. Diego felt God's call to pastoral work. And after Bible college, became the pastor of a Portuguese-speaking church in South Africa. And that's where he met his Portuguese wife, Stella. And they were engaged in church planting and leadership training in South Africa, Botswana, and Mozambique. Uh, served there for 11 years before moving to North America, to Canada for six years. 
But all the while, Diego and Stella longed to return to needy Portugal. And in 2018, the Lord opened the door to not just one, but two key ministries, church planting and theological education. The church plant is in the capital city, Lisbon, on the south side of the River Tagus. Uh, God has blessed their efforts, and the plant is now a fully established church with a weekly attendance of around 50 people or so, including children and teenagers. It's so encouraging. But secondly, alongside this, Diego has been spearheading the formation of a new Bible college, It's called the Martin Bucer Seminary, and it's the first confessionally reformed seminary in the whole country. Started about a month ago with 18 students. How encouraging is that? The impact this new seminary could have on gospel work in Portugal is incalculable. It's really thrilling. Alongside all this, Diego and Stella have the joy of raising their three children, Diego, David, and little Esther. So, Diego, thank you for being here, too. Really looking forward to hearing from you a little bit later. And then last but by no means least, I'm delighted to welcome our brother, Reverend Moore Casement. Many of you, I'm sure, will know Moore uh, due to his ministry in Belfast over the years. He was actually brought up in Ballymena after studying law, practiced as a solicitor in uh, Cardiff and London for eight years, I think, before returning home to train for the Presbyterian ministry. And he ministered in various churches, the most recent one being Second St. Field uh, here in the city. Then in 2009, Moore set up the Cornhill training course here in Belfast, where he is the director. And we're going to hear more about Cornhill a little later. Uh, But suffice to say for now, it's a course designed to help people teach God's Word accurately, effectively, and appropriately. And over the years, Moore has been instrumental in training up loads of people for all kinds of different ministries, including myself. I had the privilege of being the part of that very first group all those years ago. Some say it's the best group ever. (laughs) Now, I could tell you all about the outstanding Bible teaching and the training that we receive, provided by a whole variety of gifted pastors, or the stimulating environment, studying with other students from all over our island. But the highlight for me, and I think for everyone else, took place on Friday afternoons, when we had our preaching class But it wasn't the preaching class, but rather the lunch before the preaching class, which took place in Moore's house, uh, mountains of mouth-watering food, all lovingly prepared by Diane, Moore's wife. I ate things I'd never even seen before. Those were good days. But in all seriousness, they really were Good days, Moore, and I and lots of others are indebted to you for providing an excellent training course, and we're looking forward to you ministering God's Word to us a little bit later. So those are our guest speakers. Let's take a little look at our schedule for today. It's going to pop up on the screen for us, and we've got a full and varied program lined up. Here is what is in store. We're going to begin by launching straight into our discussion panel, where I'm going to interview Mihai, Diego, and Moore. As usual, we want you to take part, so you'll have opportunities to ask questions, so bear that in mind. Then we're going to watch a short video about Cornhill, and that will be followed by a book review. That should take us to around about 10 past 12 or so, where we're going to have a break for about 30 minutes, Get some more tea and coffee, especially for Diego. Keep him going. And um, then after we recommence, we'll hear some latest news from the mission. Then we'll watch another short video, this time focusing on the ongoing crisis in Ukraine and EMS renewed appeal for help and support. And after that, Moore is going to bring God's word to us. And I'll round things off. So that's the program. And we are trusting the Lord to bless. 
So let's begin proper. Let's commence our conference by singing our first item of praise, and it's a great one. Come, people of the risen King, and we'll stand and give God our very best praise. Please take your seats. You're in fine voice. Before we go any further, we're going to pause and ask the Lord to bless us, and I'm going to invite the Reverend Adrian Moffat to come now and open our time in a word of prayer. I can't see Adrian. He's there. Thank you, Adrian. Come ahead. Thank you. So shall we pray together? Let's pray. Your word, Heavenly Father, in the psalm says, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. And we echo the praise of the Lord in our singing. And this our time together, O God, now as we lift our worship to you, we acknowledge that you are the faithful God who covenanted, who promised in the beginning that you would send one who would crush the serpent's head, that you would raise up a redeemer, that you would bring salvation to a sinful fallen world. When the time was fully come, you sent forth your Son. Oh, how we praise you, God, 
for the height and depth and breadth and length of your love that spared not even your own son but gave him up for us all. We thank you that you have brought such a salvation in Christ through his finished work that all the world might be told of it, called to you, find your love and grace through repentance and faith, and enter into the joy of those who know your presence with them always by your Holy Spirit. Thank you that throughout the continent of Europe, as indeed all the world. You are at work, O God, demonstrating your power and grace in bringing people from darkness to light, from the captivity of sin to the wonderful freedom being children of the King. Father, we ask of you now that this time together today may be for your people an encouragement and a challenge. Encourage us, O God, as you open our eyes and our ears to hear and to see what you are doing, that we might rejoice and be glad as we say, our God is Lord of all. Give to us too, O Lord, your call and challenge, that as we see this great work, we might understand by your grace our part within it, what you would have us do. We pray, O oh Lord God, that you will undertake for all who have that role to play in our time together today. Equip and enable them, O oh Lord, that they, in answering questions and discussing matters, might enable us to see more of you, your work, your grace for your glory. In our fellowship, may we know your presence. Equip and enable us to bring that fellowship to each other, to speak your word in season, to have that bond of love amongst your people here especially as once again we have the privilege of hearing your word read and proclaimed. Bless it to us this day that O Lord God we might be drawn closer in faith and repentance to you in your son Jesus Christ. And with firmer grip, grasping all your grace and mercy, might so stand and live in him that yours is the glory and the praise. We have called one another to rejoice. Your word bids us to praise the Lord. Hear our prayer. For Jesus' name's sake. Amen. Thank you, Adrian. Now, the theme for our conference today is building for the future. In 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 13, the Apostle Paul writes these words. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For 
Paul says, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The scriptures are clear. The church's only foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the foundation put in place by the apostles, and that's the foundation we are to build on today. But how exactly do we do that? Well, there are a number of essential elements, but today we're going to focus on two of the most important. The first is training. Because the better the trainer, the better the builder. The second is disciple-making. Our mission is not to produce decisions, but disciples, real followers of Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to examine these two key components of training and disciple-making. And we'll do that as we listen to Mihai and Diego share about their ministries We're going to interact and engage with them to get their advice and counsel for us. We're going to learn what God's Word has to teach us in these matters as Moore preaches to us, all with the aim that we will be better equipped and edified to play our part in building the Church of Jesus Christ. So let's dive straight in. And with our discussion panel, so I'm going to invite Mihai, Diego, and Moore to come here at the front and join me. And I'm going to move this cross out of the way. Thank you, brother. I'll bring it right over. That's the way. Great. Thank you so much, brothers, uh, for joining me here at the front and for being willing to share of your knowledge and experiences. Looking forward to hearing some of your answers to some questions I've got. And then, as I said, we're going to open it up for others. Um, So first of all, we're going to start with you, Mihai. So tell us about yourself, a little more about your family, where you live, and especially how you came to faith, because that really is a very moving story. Thank you so much, Brother Phil. It is a great privilege and honor and joy for me to be today here with you. Um, I come from the Republic of Moldova. I am married to Irina, and together we have two little daughters, uh, Delia and Elisa, so I'm surrounded by beauty. <laughs> and um, I was saved at the age of 17, and uh, not uh, didn't grow up in a, a Christian family. Um, I was saved after m- many years of the perseverant ministry of my pastor, in which he was um, preaching the gospel, but also displaying the gospel through um, his uh, care and intentional um, mentorship toward uh, uh, me, especially uh, spending so much time with me. It was valuable, and I think, uh, uh, as I said, the gospel was displayed uh, uh, by his example in, in my life, especially in my father's absence, as he was not there because of passing away when I was 11 years old. Mm. Well, that's a really personal illustration of discipleship straight off the bat, isn't it? And one man investing himself in a younger man, and as we're going to hear, we'll see the impact that that has caused then on lots of other people. And my guess is that most people here may not know a great deal about the land of Moldova. Uh, Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I certainly didn't know a whole lot until I met uh, Mihai, and I am still learning. Uh, So, First off, where exactly is Moldova? What are the people like? And what kind of challenges does this country face? Yeah, well, um, it's on planet Earth. It's a small one (laughs) found between uh, Romania and Ukraine. Um, It's uh, a little over 2.6 million population country, a a post-Soviet Union country. Um, The culture is somewhat of a mixture uh, between 
Romanian traditions and culture which was inherited, uh, but also communism um, and Soviet Union consequences after 70 years of that. Um, there is still um, strong uh, Soviet Union melancholia, uh, especially in uh, those um, over 40 and their 50s and 60s. Um, after the fall of Soviet Union, Moldova has been affected um, strongly by uh, difficult economical situations, so it's still uh, struggling with, uh, with poverty, lots of corruption, sadly. Moldovans are known as very hardworking people, and um, uh, hospitality is one of the characteristics that may, many will, will notice. Uh, but also there is a lot of confusion when it comes to our national identity, yeah. being multiple times under uh, Tsarist Russia, then with Romania, then under Soviet Union, then in the, um, independent. So this has caused a lot of confusion as who we actually are as Moldovans. Mm. And, and one of the, the, the main challenges that you face concerns family breakdown within the country. Just explain why that's such a big issue and, and what some of the implications are. Well, you see, the countries in Soviet Union were very dependable on each other. So when the system felt um, the uh, poverty, the increasing and very, uh, um, very felt poverty in Moldova made uh, many of the um, parents to travel abroad and search for for a better future, perhaps for their children. But uh, this uh, this direction brought a lot of uh, social uh, social uh, problems. Uh, we are a leading country. I think we are third in the world in terms of divorce rate. Um, we have an entire generation where pretty much everyone after 90s who was born in Moldova, uh, just as myself, don't really know what does it mean to have a family dinner where there is mom and dad and brothers and sisters. Families are scattered, have been scattered all over Russia uh, previously, now all over Europe. And that, that is affecting a lot uh, mm. uh, the, the people. Mm -hmm. And we're going to find out a little bit more about how from your own experience and background, you've been able to use some of your experiences to impact other families um, within the country. What about the religion in Moldova, uh, and how exactly does that impact upon the gospel there? Well, Moldovans, uh, being a Moldovan, it means to be an Eastern Orthodox, and if you are anything else, then you are not uh, faithful to your nation, to your to the uh, inherited faith from your parents. You would be considered a betrayer of your of your parents' faith. Um, but actually, um, orthodoxy was more in the past centuries when it came to Moldova. Uh, it was more like a forced cloth that was dressed under a very profound and deep paganism and even though there are there are decades and decades and centuries already of since there is eastern orthodox in the country um, you will find a lot of uh, pagan practices in uh, villages usually um, the classic road of a struggling moldovan will be to go to the priest and then to a monastery, and then if the, so, if the problem is not solved, then to the witch in the village, that, that, that definitely will, will help. Um, it is uh, difficult going with the gospel in some locations because there is a much fear from the priests, mm -hmm. and um, there is a lot of uh, false assumptions fed into uh, the society. I remember when I was in 11th grade, my biology teacher was asking me if we are bringing babies are sacrifices at, uh, at the church. So uh, there is still a lot of false assumptions and there are many challenges in mm. proclamation of the gospel. Okay, so despite the, the opposition and the hostility, the Lord has worked pretty mightily in Moldova, particularly in the fairly recent past. In fact, the country experienced a remarkable revival, uh, a spiritual awakening uh, just a few decades ago. Um, so what happened then? 
Well, 70 years uh, under um, Soviet Union um, brought uh, hunger for for spirituality for for the bible i was told as uh, many of the uh, people of my grandparents age they were not having access to the bible during soviet union they will have to uh, and we are talking about 80s and 70s they will have to handwrite the gospel and copy a different uh, by handwriting the gospel in the villages uh, they will walk miles and miles by foot in cold weather to to find the church so when the system felt indeed god has blessed our country with a spiritual revival uh, people were were crowding the uh, the church facilities there were a lot of evangelistic uh, outreaches on the streets and crowds will gather to listen uh, to a, a preacher preaching and um, um, this was a time uh, of when when our our nation has uh, has felt god's blessing indeed in a special way mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I think it's believed to be the most recent revival within the continent of Europe. So there have been encouraging signs of growth in the breadth of Moldovan evangelicalism, but would you agree that there remains a pressing need for similar growth in depth with regards to biblical theology and doctrine? Indeed. Um, the many of the people who came in the churches and uh, and many villages buildings were being built for hundreds of people but sadly hundreds and thousands uh, whenever they had the, their first ticket to the west uh, they left the country so now sadly you will you will go in many villages you will find a facility which might fit perhaps 300 people but there will be 15 elderly people meeting somewhere in an underground room because they need to hit um, there was a, 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 a large number of people coming to faith but um, the depth of that faith for different reason was uh, was never a thing um, there were many um, challenging and dangerous also ideas brought as these doors opened up from the Soviet Union when it fell and uh, you will have all sorts of, of, of uh, missionaries coming in now for Moldovans who at time um, very few perhaps none were were schooled in theology mm -hmm. uh, the stereotype will be well anyone who comes from the West with a Bible it's it's worth accepting and uh, what was accepted was not necessarily um, everything good. And um, the, the Moldovan evangelicalism stagnated somewhere. Uh, the, many, many factors contributed to there, but, but um, up until now, there is a lot of biblical illiteracy. Mm. And uh, I think uh, when it comes to a solid theological uh, grasp of the Bible, there is indeed a uh, great famine in the land. Hmm. And that would see itself coming through even in the preaching that would happen within the country. Is that right, Mihai? Yes, the, there will be almost no expository preaching. I think I learned about it when I first read David Helm's little book on expository preaching back in 2018. And I realized that I never actually witnessed what I read in the book about. Um, and much, much of the preaching is, is not of um, evil motives. The problem is that there are many um, unhealthy stereotypes for example, one of the uh, very strong stereotype, which is in most of the churches, is that uh, there is not such thing as a vocational pastor. Uh, because in Soviet Union, if you were not working, you will go in prison. And being a pastor would not be considered a work. And many of the churches embraced that mindset to a point where many, up until now, will not imagine how a pastor will be a full-time pastor. He has to work and then find time to prepare sermons. And then, then of course, there will not be enough time. And then you can imagine when a person is full-time working and you usually having farms in the villages. And mm -hmm. this will definitely affect the, qual the quality and the depth of preaching. 
Thank you so much, Mihai. That has given us a really good feel for the country and some of the, the challenges and opportunities for gospel work there. Uh, we'll give you a little breather now. If you want to pass the mic over to Diego. Uh, so, uh, Diego, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I've given a little bit of information. Tell us about your family, where you live, and how you came to be a missionary in Portugal. Well, we live in Lisbon, actually, great area, uh, the greater Lisbon area, as it's called. Uh, just, you know, we actually see the Tagus River from our house, uh, which is beautiful. I wish you all could see that as well. Um, and uh, we lived there and we planted a church there. How I came to be a missionary is that, well, we, as a family, we have Iberian heritage. Uh, and... Um, I was always connected to Portugal somehow, Portugal and Spain, uh, family and, and all of that. So when when I started ministry, always that had that in my heart. Mm -hmm. I want to go back and, and preach uh, to to in some somewhere uh, in Iberia, Spain or Portugal. Mm -hmm. uh, but I ended up going to South Africa first, pastoring a Portuguese church. So. All of those years in ministry in South Africa and in Canada, I was ministering to Portuguese people. And uh, I was in Canada and Tiago Oliveira, which is the president of our seminary, called me and he asked me a question that actually made me think. He said, has it occurred to you that the Portuguese people are actually in Portugal? <laughs> and I said, yes, but as you know, there are more Portuguese people outside of Portugal than in Portugal. Mm -hmm which is also true, uh, but that touched my heart and we started praying and they invited me to come over to Portugal to, to, help, uh, to help to start the, mission, uh, the, the seminary mm. and then the church plant came, uh, came along with that as well. Okay, so before we dive into your ministry, let's focus again on the context. So tell us uh, a little bit about Portugal itself. Uh, in many ways, I'm sure it's very different from Moldova, but I'm guessing there are probably some common themes between the two countries. Um, what's Portugal like from a spiritual perspective? Yes, as Mihai was, was sharing, I was thinking uh, back home, uh, as, as you spoke before, I was brought up a Roman Catholic, and when I heard the gospel the first time, it was about nine, and then the Lord said to me it was ten, it was kind of betraying my family and betraying my heritage. Uh, in Portugal, it's the same. Uh, there are two things that makes you a Portuguese person, a Portuguese man. You are Roman Catholic and you speak Portuguese. Mm. Uh, those two things, doesn't matter where you were born or, you know, the, not even ethnicities, ethnicities, oh man. Eth <laughs> yes, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, it's hard to say that in Portuguese as well. Um, it's hard to say it when yeah, you yeah, four hours ex to sleep. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's not that much, but the culture itself, it's what makes us what mm. we are. Mm. Uh, and then when you become evangelical, it's like you betray your culture. You betray your people. Uh, that's very strong. I had people in my family that, that stopped speaking to me because I became evangelical. Uh, my grandfather mm. spent many years without talking to me because I became evangelical. And then when I became a pastor, it became worse. Um, so in, in many ways, the Portuguese culture is very similar. But, you know, uh, it's a Roman Catholic heritage. Mm. And tell us then a little bit about the, the evangelical church within Portugal. I mean, is it healthy? Um, it's obviously small, but, it, but is it healthy? Is it strong standard of preaching, depth of sort of doctrinal knowledge and so on, what's that like? There is a lot of biblical illiteracy as well. Mm. Um, it's, it's amazing how people know things about the Bible, but they don't really understand how it connects to the gospel. So most of the applications people have from the Bible are very, very mystical sometimes and strange in many mm. ways, probably because of their heritage as well. Uh, so the, the, there is a need for biblical exposition from 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 the south to the north, mm. uh, we have expositors in in Portugal, but it, that movement is very recent. I would say that about ten years ago or so, 
some people started really thinking about preaching um, expository messages. Even even reformed reformed pastors right. had a problem with that in the past, right. uh, but now it's getting better. So what, what I, I would say is that there are challenges like just like that, you know, secularism uh, and you know. Um, mystical heritage in terms of Roman Catholic um, heritage. However, there is hope because we see young people really interested in learning and, and a lot of people come to us asking for Bible studies because mm. they won't understand the Bible. Mm. Uh, so yes, there are those difficulties in the churches, but we have a lot of hope coming from the next generation or youngsters in general. That's encouraging. So you're involved in, um, Diego, in these two very strategic ministries, church planting, theological education, uh, building up a new body of believers and raising up a new generation of church leaders. But describe for us what things were like in those early days, particularly in the church. I mean, how did it all begin? Um, what size was the work? Um, how has it progressed since then? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, when when we came to Portugal, we start we started working for the seminary. So so it started together. Uh, the seminary took ten years to start, from the beginning, from the planning, mm. until what we do now. However, when I came uh, four years ago, the Second Baptist Church in Lisbon, the Church of Lapa. Uh, they were. They had some families having to cross the river to come to church every Sunday, and some people were driving 50 k's to come to church uh, to to listen to expository preaching. Uh, so they were actually thinking and praying for someone to go to the other side and plant a church. Now, as I came to the church, they thought, "Well, are you considering pastoring a church?" Because I was one of the pastors in the church at the time. And I thought, yes, I think I think it would be a good model. Uh, not only talk about theological training, but actually put into practice uh, planting a church that would be uh, a model. At least we hope a model of of a healthy church in Portugal. So those things came together. We want to be a church that is doing the work at home, but also um, helping other churches uh, follow the same. Um, pattern of of healthiness in the church um, that's helpful now your wife stella i know is also very active in the life of your church as she teaches the woman and i know that she speaks at some pretty significant conferences in the country tell us about her ministry as well diego oh stella is she loves studying the bible with other women uh, that's her calling uh, she loves teaching the children as well uh, she leads the ministry, the children's ministry in the church and the women's ministry. Uh, she has a, a YouTube program, you know, it's well uh, watched in Portugal and in Brazil, uh, where she takes a text that's usually taken out of context, and she helps them to see that it's out of context. Uh, and it's a really, really, uh, really interesting ministry because a lot of people from from portugal are calling her and asking her questions uh, women especially well most women we have some we have some men watching the the programs as well uh and then she says no talk to my husband uh, uh, <laughs> but but it's because there is a hunger to understand god's word as well so she's been helping um some other churches as well to jumpstart uh, women's ministries that will be centered around the world the, the word of god mm. and um leave it there uh, and um that's what she's doing right now mm. that's great it's encouraging you're also really involved in the charles simeon trust yes um what is that why do you think it's such a valuable ministry and and what's your role within it diego the Charles Simeon Trust is um, a trust like Proclamation Trust you have here, um, mainly to help other pastors to improve and progress in their preaching. Uh, we come together at least once a year as a group uh, to refine our skills, help each other, go back to foundations like spring training. Uh, the, concept, the concept of spring training is going back every year and talking about the basics and working the basics in sports 
So it's applied as well to pastors when they, they get together, they help each other uh, to fine tune the skills of preaching. Uh, and we do that every year and, and in many locations. So as an instructor, I've been to different places in, in Brazil, in Canada, um, and in Portugal now. We just mm -hmm. had our first one in Lisbon. Korea, that's really exciting. But alongside your work with the Charles Simeon Trust, being a pastor, arranging and speaking at all kinds of different conferences, uh, you're also the coordinator of this brand new seminary. Um, so when did the seminary start? Uh, why did it start? Why is it significant? And what are your hopes going forward? Well, it started, as I said before, 10 years ago. Um, two churches came together and they thought, we really need a seminary that is uh, confessionally reformed. Uh, there was no seminary that was confessionally reformed in our country. And there was a big need for that because we saw what was happening. We needed to fill pulpits where the church was becoming reformed. And we needed to help people, uh, some people, uh, some churches in transition, some churches that were reformed, but pastors are getting retired. Uh, it's a fact that m more than 70% of the pastors in Portugal will retire in the next five years. Uh, and we, we are in a crisis. Mm -hmm. So the seminary took long, like everything the Portuguese does, it takes years uh, in planning and thinking and rethinking. Um, <laughs> I know that we, we take long to think and strategize, and it was necessary to do it well done, mm -hmm. because a lot, of, a lot of things start in our country and they die. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we came together. I've been part of this for five years now, uh, since I was in Canada, I started planning with them. So we prepared for four years. When the pandemic came, we had to postpone it for one year. But we started. And what was the second question? Why is that necessary? Yeah, why was it necessary? Yeah. It is necessary for that very reason. Uh, we have a crisis and we need uh, more reformed preachers in the pulpits of our churches. And 18 students who have... We, yes, we have 18 students now. We have three levels. We have advanced, uh, intermediate, and basic. Mm -hmm. um, we're not counting the basic ones uh, as full, full students, but the intermediate and, and advanced, because advanced is focused on ministry. Uh, it's for pastors. And also the intermediate, uh, we are training a lot of deacons and elders in churches, uh, lay elders as well, mm. uh, they're studying with us. Um, but f uh, students that are actually taking all the courses and participating in everything we do are about 18, but we have more people actually engaging in other disciplines as well. Uh, that's very exciting. It is really exciting, isn't it? Uh, we can certainly be praying for the work of the seminary and for its long-term <laughs> impact upon gospel work within Portugal. I'm going to jump back now to you, Mihai. Um, you planted the Imago Deo Baptist Church in Kishinau back in 2018, and the work is still fairly small. It's obviously a young church, but the Lord has blessed, and you're engaged in a whole array of ministries. Um, tell us about one or two of those really key ministries, specifically to do with discipleship and training? When um, we planted the church, as well as uh, Lord in his uh, um, providence brought us to reform convictions, uh, it was in the beginning the zeal, perhaps, you know, to convince everyone and to help everyone understand and see those Bible verses, but uh, then um, um, gladly God helped us realize that it might not be the wisest approach. Uh, you see, when it comes to Reformed theology, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, considered uh, a thing to be loved or to be embraced in Moldova. Uh, people actually consider it, especially in evangelical um, culture, consider it as a threat. So I heard once Steve Lawson said, well, if you want to reform a churches, you reform their pulpits. So that's uh, why um, uh, in the beginning we started um, this uh, preaching classes for ministers and uh, we were so encouraged to see the interest of so many. We would have um, 
15, 18, sometimes even 20 uh, pastors, preachers from different churches come and, uh, and, and study. So we have been doing that uh, up until uh, COVID came. But then uh, um, we uh, had also the privilege to uh, have um, a couple of internship programs. Now, uh, also it is, uh, in, it is uh, oh, I think the battery might just have gone. Give it another try. <clears throat> yeah, it is um, interesting how we started an internship. Basically, one of the students from the only um, evangelical school that we had, he wanted to join our church, and the teachers were not happy because they know it's a reformed church, so he was threatened that he will be kicked out of the school, and he was. He joined the church, he was kicked out of the school, and uh, yeah, that's it. <clears throat> and uh, I promised him that we will help him with uh, education and that's how started our first internship program and then um, later on another minister from a different church he uh, was interesting in, uh, in uh, reformed theology as well and uh, he came for several months and uh, we, we do um, spend a lot of time with the man in the church um, in uh, discipling and in talking about uh, uh, doctrine and about uh, exposition. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. <clears throat> and a, a big part of, of this has to do with uh, whenever we meet with the man in the church is not trying not to make it only theoretical, but also as after we, we, we talk through different doctrines, uh, we will try to see, okay, how this connects actually into uh, the life of the church, uh, how justification by faith alone, what would be the implication in pastoral ministry. Um, we have a lot of people uh, because mainly in an Armenian context, a struggle with assurance. Uh, I've met many people who will be depressed because they will not be sure anymore if they're saved. So how do you minister those uh, theological doctrines that you came to embrace? How do you minister to those people in practical action, actually? So this will be the kind of conversations that we will have uh, multiple times throughout the week with uh, the group of men in our churches as well. That's great. And you also hold conferences to try to influence other pastors and churches with good doctrine yeah once in a while we will organize a conference and we will advertise it and there will be an interest so even though um, people are somewhat opposed to reform theology um, um, as uh, Diego said um, I can also witness that there is indeed hope um, and, and especially in the last five years or so I could witness um, somewhat of an increasing curiosity uh, among especially younger ministers and they will come to these conferences and they will have will have deep conversations with them and uh, um, I can say that this hunger is felt and um, if you provide an alternative like these conferences or we just started um, like, a, like a local um, more non-formal um, educational program once a month we held a session we call it Imago Dei Academy so uh, we have about 17 people who signed up for it and we are very encouraged it's uh, five min ministers from five different churches with uh, some younger men who are involved in preaching so um, there is a hunger and we are privileged to be able to provide an alternative for, for mm. that. That's great. And very briefly, tell us a little bit about um, your discipleship groups, because you spend a lot of time just with small groups and even one-to-one. -one. I know you're thinking about um, trying to raise up elders for the church, so just tell us a little bit about those kind of intentional discipleship groups and, and meetings. A couple times a week, we will meet. Um, uh, I will meet with um, different groups of the men, of men from our church. So, actually, me being here for this week, uh, it's uh, this is possible after um, 
a few years of intensive weekly meetings when we will talk through doctrine, we will uh, we'll talk through hermeneutics, and um, at the moment there are at least five men capable to um, lead a Bible study to prepare a sermon in, in my absence, and I'm very encouraged by that. Um, we will try to make, so I think my passion and uh, uh, desire to see discipleship happening so much in our church is somewhat of a of a consequence as well of what my pastor has done. Mm. Um, God has used him in a wonderful way, not only to bring me to salvation, but also to um, to embed in in in, in my uh, understanding the importance of an organic, ongoing discipleship where it's not only formal, but we would have a coffee with one of the brothers, and at one point, I'll, I'll just challenge him, okay, uh, I'm, I'm an uh, Eastern Orthodox person who just went through divorce, or who is struggling through addiction, share the gospel with me. And, and the brothers in the church, they know that this will can come unexpectedly. It can come at any moment. So uh, we, we are not using such moments to um, humiliate anyone or to, but rather to encourage each one. And I will, I will challenge them to, to come with uh, unexpected questions to me. So we're trying to build it into the very DNA of our church now in the early stages, hopeful that uh, this will uh, be used by God uh, to, to bless not only our church, but also anyone in the larger evangelical community in Moldova. Mm. Great. Thank you so much, Mihai. Mur, you've been waiting really patiently. Um, <coughs> no, I'm quite guys... happy for them to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> the guys can jump in here too, but we're going we're gonna to stick with you for most of it, Mur. Uh, the two key areas that we've been looking at are, of course, training and disciple-making. What are the main differences between these two elements i told phil i wasn't sure i liked any of his questions actually i thought they're a bit too probing um <clears throat> it's an interesting one because i suppose as christians we're all called to be disciples we're all learners we're all followers um and so there's a level i suppose in which disciple making is is what we do with every christian as we seek to develop and mature them um, it's interesting to hear you talk about things that are more intentional with with certain people where you see perhaps a bit more potential in terms of what they might do and leadership roles and so on. Um, so there's an aspect of discipleship, I think, that happens as God's word is proclaimed. So as we preach, we are discipling. Um, hopefully as well, I think in that, we're uh, developing an appetite in people for God's word because as it is taught, they, they hear things that they hadn't thought about before. Um, it's not always predictable. Actually, there's more that we could know. So they want to know more and people will do that in various formats in smaller groups um, and perhaps one-to-one. -one, uh, all of those ways that we kind of encourage one another and seek to develop in our relationship with Christ uh, as we support one another within the body. I suppose one of the aspects of training, and essentially because that's what I do, um, is more to develop those particular gifts that God has given to people that will bless and build up his church, um, whether those be preaching gifts, which is largely, I suppose, where my focus tends to be, um, or in other ways as well, where people may not become a pastor of a church, but actually they will be involved in leadership roles, um, and they need training so that they understand what it is that we believe and are able to communicate that to others, because it's not just a pastor of a church who has responsibility for um, communicating that truth. Mm. Often those informal conversations are very significant where elders and others speak to people who are having a problem with something. It doesn't always have to come back to the pastor. Um, but I suppose in training, um, what we're seeking to do is to equip people better, to give them more confidence in the Bible in days when that's being eroded. Mm. Um, and then to be able to, to pass that on to others. That's really clear, really helpful. Thanks, Moore. 
Um, let's turn to the scripture. So Titus chapter 2 is a really important chapter in terms of, of discipleship. What, what can we learn from that particular chapter? Are there any principles, any kind of practical applications we could pull out? Um, it's again, it's an, it's an interesting one. Um, because if you're familiar with Titus 2, um, Paul tells Titus to teach various groups within the church. Um, and there must be an element, again, that comes back to what we proclaim from the front as we um, preach God's word. But if you look a bit more closely in it, um, you'll see that when it comes to older women and younger women, he he gives a rule to older women in terms of teaching younger women, um, which is not something that um, Titus is primarily charged with. So which I think that tends to suggest to me that there's a level to which um, within churches there should be that uh, relationship going on, not just pastor to people, but um, other leaders within the church, older, teaching younger, um, passing on the truth to them in situations where it's kind of lived out. So there's a limit to what we can do as we preach. We try to apply God's word as faithfully as we can. We can't deal with every situation that people in our churches are facing. And therefore, I think there's actually a need um, that we are in smaller groups uh, passing on that wisdom of years from older men to younger men, from older women to younger women, as to how we live out our faith in practice. Um, and uh, I think that's quite significant in terms of how the teaching that we get can be grounded. Mm. So it, it is not simply enough that the Bible is really well taught from the front. I think that's crucial. And that's, I suppose, where my main focus is. But I think there needs to be something else worked out on the ground, if you like, as people go, we're, we're taking the Bible seriously. What does that look like for us? What have I learnt? What am I still learning? Um, how can I pass that on, encourage those that are younger, develop them? Um, and um, I, I suppose in our context in Northern Ireland, um, one of the really interesting things is the, the older woman and younger woman principle, because I think we haven't always been as strong in that as we, we might have passed on from mothers to daughters a bit sometimes perhaps, but actually that whole idea of women within the church um, have a real role. Um, and most of us are probably coming from backgrounds where women are not at the front preaching, whatever, but actually that doesn't mean that there isn't a vital role that uh, should be given to women in terms of passing on truth, um, how we understand how the Bible relates to our lives um, and uh, the particular responsibilities that God has, has given to women um, in the situations in which they find themselves. So I think that's something that still needs developing in our churches. Um, sure. Undoubtedly. Thank you. Any of the other guys want to add anything to that? Diego, do you want to jump in? Well, well Titus 2.2, 2, uh, it's the motto of the ministry of the women in my church. Um, <laughs> It's amazing, even for older women now, uh, they come and talk, they, they will say something that's very, let me put this way, it occurs a lot. I wish someone told me that before, hmm. um, especially about in the implications of the gospel in family life, the implications of the gospel bringing up children, being a good wife or a good sister to the sisters in the church, um, and that's coming up a lot. So it has to do with that practical level of the implications of what you hear from the pulpit, what you have in your Bible study, day to day, one to one as well. So we're having a lot of that now. Mm. And all the women are actually discipling, discipling the younger, uh, saying, I wish I knew what I'm actually telling you now. Mm. So take this as a treasure mm. and apply to your life. So mm. it's happening a lot. That's inspiring, isn't it? Um, Let's move on back to you, Moore. How can we keep local churches at the centre of our training? Um, well, I suppose, just from a personal point of view, um, what I do at Cornhill um, is not 
in competition, but in partnership with the local church. Uh, so people who come to Cornhill are involved in a local church. Most of them are only there two days a week. Um, many of them are actually working in a local church in some capacity. All of them are involved in a local church. Um, and um, I'm seeking to equip them for whatever they're doing within that context, but I think it's vital that um, they're involved in a local church. Um, I'm not about the kind of the theory of it all. It has to be earthed. Yeah. Um, and whatever training I'm giving to people needs to be worked out um, in whatever context they are in. Um, it's easy just to kind of retreat and give these sermons in a vacuum, but actually um, we want to see how God's word impacts the situations that we're in. And unless you're plugged into a local church, you're not really encountering that. So the local church is absolutely vital um, in terms of any training uh, and because that's where it is earthed. Mm -hmm. Mihai, do you want to add? Yeah. One very sad um, reality that uh, we, we see almost each year in uh, the, those graduating that uh, only uh, evangelical university that we have in Kishinev at the moment is by the end of the school, many will almost not, not attend the churches anymore. Yeah. And this will will happen increasingly. First year, they will be very faithful every week, like myself, and I'm talking about my own experience as well. Getting to the end of the of the studies, almost not not, uh, and this is perhaps because of a very poor doctrine of the church, a very poor ecclesiology. Um, and even though we had mostly pastors teaching teaching us, um, but uh, also you know, a very poor understanding of membership, uh, where church is almost optional and Sunday mornings are not mandatory, because there is not not a, uh, an understanding of the importance of God's law. Um, so um, I found uh, um, very valuable. Uh, it was actually, we, we had an internship program uh, after I read um, um, The Trellis and the Wine mm -hmm. from, uh, by, uh, from those from Matthias Ministry. It was a very helpful uh, read for me because it helped me get a perspective of why we have some of the things that we have in our own country. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, internship is just, I think, was for us one kind of an alternative and a way in which we we have education but uh, the, the young man who was going through internship he was also in some of the meetings when he will see how a, a potential member is being interviewed then we'll have a chat when we will discuss with him okay here we talked about worship this is our house our Sunday morning is being done and this is why this is where doctrine connects and this is and I did not have that in school and I think whenever school is being done if those connections are made that's it's very important. Mm. And that book that you mentioned, The Trellis and the Vine, I, I can't remember the authors. Colin Marshall. Colin Marshall, yeah. It's definitely worth a read for any of you who would like to develop your understanding a little bit more. Um, let's follow on from that. Obviously then there must be huge benefits with having pastors being some of the, the teachers within the training system. Mira? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, there's no point in training people to do something that you can't do yourself. You know, it's the whole acronym, those that can do, those that cannot teach. Um, it's one of the things I often say before I preach. It's very <clears throat> humbling to think I'm trying to teach people how to preach. Can't even do it myself. Um, but I suppose... It is important that pastors are involved in this uh, on two levels as well. So, I mean, I think there's the, the level of the pastor in the local church taking responsibility um, for people within their congregation, um, spotting people who have potential gifts and trying to develop those and encourage those and nurture those. Um, and certainly, I think we we shouldn't take that responsibility away from local pastors, that they have wisdom that they can pass on within their own setting and, and wisdom from years of experience also. Um, but at the same time, I suppose there will be instances where there are certain people who um, have 
certain gifts in terms of training others um, in teaching people how to do things that not every pastor will be able to do to the same extent. So some people can do it, but actually they're not as good in teaching others mm. how to do it. Um, and so I think what we need to find is, you know, people in the right roles doing those things um, and seeing that kind of working together aspect. So I suppose what, I mean, I think in terms of what I do, it's very limited. I'm like, I feel like a one trick pony, um, but I, I try to do something I think God has given me a certain amount of ability in, and that develops over years of listening to sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon. Um, Phil was very good, even at the start. Um, <clears throat> but um, but uh, I think we need to have people in the right places um, doing what they're skilled to do. But it is that collaboration with the local church. So I think the pastor and the church on the ground um, has those years of experience potentially that they and wisdom that they can pass on may not be exclusively in terms of the preaching and teaching but actually so much else that they've learned um, and um, I think one of the challenges I suppose uh, is is in development of character as well and and you can't teach that to people um, and to an extent as well uh, they learn that from those who are teaching them, but actually from those that are ministering to them in their local setting. Um, and again, that's that's not something I can particularly do. I can try a little bit, but actually it's the pastor on the ground who can um, input most effectively into that, I think. Okay, last question for now before we open it up to everyone else. Give us some advice. Um, maybe some people are here and we'd like to know, you know, how could we identify the next elder, the next missionary, the next pastor within our own local congregation? Are there, are there some kind of practical, is there some kind of practical help or advice you could give us? It'd be nice if there was a checklist, wasn't there? And, and some people don't fit any mold or whatever. Um, I think... Well, I suppose if you take it back to the level of, let's start at teenage level. I think sometimes with teenagers, um, obviously you have to know them first off, so you have to be doing something with them to see what potential there is there. Um, but often um, within smaller group settings, you can start to get a feel for some people who actually have a greater appetite for God's word or a greater understanding of things. They just seem that bit more switched on. Perhaps they're actually in bringing friends along. They're sort of outward looking, outward focused. Um, it's it's not hard to spot ability, um, but I suppose what we're looking for is not purely ability, but actually the convictions underneath that. Uh, that will mean something might last yeah. uh, and um, sometimes perhaps we're too wowed by ability um, uh, but actually the person who's consistent the person who actually comes along when they're the only person of their age at something yeah. I mean that kind of stands out to me if somebody has that level of commitment to go well this isn't fairly cool to be here but I believe in this yeah. um, the person who comes to the prayer meeting. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't think you can put too high a price on the person who will come to the church prayer meeting. That sounds very old fashioned in the days in which we live. Um, but um, I think that says a lot. Mm. Um, but again, it's down to getting alongside people, getting to know them. Um, and perhaps sometimes as well, I think one of the harder things is there will be some people who have quiet convictions that maybe need a wee bit more encouragement uh, to develop something that is there and maybe you see a spark or something. Um, it's maybe harder work, but actually taking the time can be very mm. productive mm. Um, in the long run. But there are no easy answers to this. Um, but I think the one caution is we're quite good at raising up people who are able to do go on teams and all the rest of it. You know, we're quite good at that now. Um, but we need to look for what's below the surface. Um, and sometimes that's a little bit harder to discern. 
That's really insightful. Thank you so much, Moore. Thank you to the two guys as well. So far, I've got loads more questions I could ask, but we want to open it up. Um, so you can ask a question to any of each of the brothers here, maybe about their ministry or about the issues we've been talking about in terms of discipleship and training. Maybe you can share about your own uh, context. So pop up your hand if you would like to ask a question and ask it nice and loud. Who wants to go first? Yes, thank you, Deb. Good. Um, this is more on a personal level. So you talked about the position um, in your know, culture and families. Have any members of your own families come to faith since you did? Mm. And that's the question. Yeah. Um, I had the great privilege and joy. Uh, so in my in my family, just just as Diego, I grew up, I was brought up in an Eastern Orthodox family, and, and as as much as I could research in my extent family, I tried to get to my great grandparents, and I didn't find anyone being uh, saved or no believing the gospel. Um, so we, we we were praying a lot, and I had the great joy and privilege two months ago to baptize my own sister who is now um, an active member of our church, helping a lot, especially with, uh, with the ministry of the Ukrainians. So, uh, and um, I was just uh, showing uh, Isaac yesterday mm -hmm. a very dear picture uh, of my pastor uh, on um, the last days of life of my grandfather who was somewhat like your grandfather, like, yeah, but the, the, he was not refusing to communicate with me. He was more sarcastic and always, even at times, putting me down and making bad jokes. He got cancer in the late years of life, and um, I asked him if he would want a Bible, and he accepted, he, yeah, bring a Bible. And then the last two weeks, I invited the pastor, and um, I have this picture where he is, has his eyes full of tears, telling my pastor that he, there is one thing that he wants from God, and this is forgiveness. It, it's an encouraging and dear picture of mine. I do pray still for, for others in my family. They are um, calling me whenever they, need to, they get in hospital or they get in big problems. They call me and they ask, please pray. Yeah. Well, this is one interesting thing. In, in the village where I grew up, many of the Eastern Orthodox, we had multiple situations like this. Late in the evening, just like Nicodemus, they will come and ask a meeting with, my, with the pastor and ask for prayers. So on the background, the Orthodox people in the village, they knew that the prayers of the believers are heard. And we had many situations like this. Um, I had the privilege to see my mother and my sisters come to Christ. Um, so my, my family is very complicated in that sense, you know, my, my, my father uh, is not married to my mother, where they have different families. Uh, and I'm praying for my father and sharing the gospel to him. He's very involved in Roman Catholicism. He's, he's one of those guys that goes to Rome when he can. Um, it's very ingrained. However, we have, we have had good conversations. Uh, so, yeah, my great-grandmother as well, before she died, she, she came to the Lord as well. I shared the gospel to her. She prayed uh, with me. Um, and she started praying, reading the Bible before the Lord took her away. So, yes, I've seen a lot of fruits there in my family as well. Um, and, and also relatives. Uh, the Lord is saving one here and there. Sometimes not even connected to me, but the Lord is doing that. Mm. So, um, yeah, we, we've seen that. However... There is also this necessity that uh, Mihai just uh, shared about, or shared with us, I mean. When someone needs prayer, they don't go to a Catholic priest anymore. They usually get on the phone and call me. Um, in the family, relatives, friends, uh, they, they prefer uh, someone that they, they trust in some sense for prayer mm. so prayer has been a great tool of ev evangelistic tool in my family and also in our context in portugal uh, mm. families ask for prayer very often that's really interesting what a great question 
oftentimes at these kinds of events we can focus purely on the ministry and the upfront stuff but actually it's so important to know about the family and and we can be praying for the the families of our brothers here anyone else want to ask a question pop up your hand yes Simon. We spend so much time investing in future leaders, uh, training, pastoral responsibilities, church family. I just wonder about your own individual lives, how you keep yourself fresh, uh, how you keep yourself in close communion with God. Hmm. <laughs> I think you've been I'll nominated for. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll pass it right back. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, it's a great question. It, it, it's daily prayer and Bible reading. Um, I think as well, I suppose one of the challenges for people who teach and preach is being really fed themselves. Now, one of the blessings of the age in which we live is you can listen to other people who are actually very good uh, Bible teachers. Um, and I do do that, and I'm blessed by that. I'm part of a local church. I um, have the word ministered to me. When I'm not out preaching myself, then I'm part of that. Um, but uh, I mean, I think it is one of the blessings of the age in which we live. And sometimes you do need to, to do that to sort of feed through others who God is pretty gifted and, and whose ministry you appreciate and kind of connect with. Um, one of the challenges I tell my students, I suppose, is that as you <clears throat> as you're being taught and taught how to think about preaching and what you do yourself and analysing that, um, I suppose one of the difficulties at times is that you just become an analyzer of what you're being told. Um, and this is God's word. We want to be fed ourselves, and, and there's a balance in terms of that humility that feels I can learn from whoever um, but I suppose there's also an aspect in which there are certain people you will learn more from and you can trust as you listen to them and I mean I love listening to preachers who I basically trust I just think I'm just going to accept what you say I'm not going to try to analyze how well or badly you're doing this mm -hmm. Sorry. um I I should be honest and say that I'm not always managing that well. Um, there will be times, you know, when you get just so busy, and uh, I I love being busy. I I'm 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 sometimes an extreme form or extrovert, always being with people, and um, sometimes my wife will warn me perhaps and tell me, hey, how 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 are you doing on your own walk? And I also. I'm trying constantly to ask the brothers in our church, please be bold about approaching and confronting me with personal questions. Um, because you are doing your best to, 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 to be um, on, on, on your own personal uh, spiritual relationship with, with, with Christ and feeding yourself and, and trying the, the, the sermons that you're prepared to be also your devotions. But you find sometimes that uh, you, you've prepared the sermon and you even preached it, but it was not a devotion as much as it should have been done. So I, I'm trying constantly to ask the brothers and even my wife, like, please um, do, do ask me questions like this as often as possible because uh, I, need, I need the church and that's why God has put the people around us that we, we sharpen each other. Yeah. I was reading Charles Swinock and, and something changed in my mind. It was like a key. Uh, from heart to heart, I when I start preparing my sermon Monday, uh, the word has first to speak to me first, and I do that really in a devotional sense first, and then I start working on the text and everything else. Family worship as well. Oh Lord, <laughs> how many days? Um, that we, I'm downtrodden, I'm tired, and just to pray with my kids. And in a sense, yes, it's a discipleship, discipleship moment as well, but it's so refreshing. It's such a blessing when your kids pray for you, and your wife prays for you, and you open the Bible together. Uh, it's being, those family worship times, I wouldn't exchange it for anything in my life. 
they they really a blessing to me. Hmm. Thanks, Simon. That was that was another good question. Uh, so we've got time maybe for one more. Yes. Do you mean public schools? Yes. Um, in Moldova, there are two things you cannot do in a public school, and this is, they will say, political propaganda and religious propaganda. You're not allowed. Now, um, just as recently, some several years ago, they've introduced the religious class, a, a religion class, but that's optional. Most of the times, because the evangelicals are very few in, in, in schools, most of the times the, the person to preach will be the priest. And there is not just necess- enough uh, kids from families of believers who will be able to inquire. Um, since 2016, I have been, one part before we started the church, I have been teaching in many public schools in, in Chisinau, uh, but mostly topics like bullying and um, um, different uh, social moral topics. But what I was doing is trying to uh, build as many relationship with the students. And then I'll tell them, hey, listen, on that address, we are meeting with a group of young people. So why don't you come? And when they are on our territory, we have our rules. (laughs) And we don't have necessarily to uh, censor us as the government does. But in schools, the schools are trying, they're trying to keep them as secular as possible so just to understand the question is the influence of our family in the public school or or the education of our children Uh, oh no yeah Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes you some some doors are open in Portugal because they want to be democratic about you know um, Uh, opportunities to teach and sometimes some pastors can can get that as well but for that you have to be uh, you have to have some credential credential in terms of being ordained or usually uh, academic credentials as well so that's why it's important to have that we were talking about that this morning Uh, our church is very involved members of our church involved in a ministry called uh, in Portuguese is crescendo com amigos which means that growing with friends um, it's it's an organization, a Christian organization that gets in contact to public schools and helps kids that are in trouble in learning or social uh, skills. So through that, a lot of things are happening, uh, but it, it's intentional. Uh, the members, it's not a ministry of the church, but a lot of members of our church are involved. It's actually a ministry from the UK. I just don't recall the name, the name here. Uh, in the UK, however, it's 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 growing in Portugal, and our church is very involved. And there are cases where that relationship uh, connected to a family need, and that need was addressed from the church. Uh, so yeah, that's how sometimes it's it's being done. Hmm. I think we could squeeze in one more question. If someone has a burning question you'd like to ask, we could get yeah, go ahead, Johnny. Mihai, I've heard that you do some work with Ukrainian refugees. Can you share that with us? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, we, uh, we have been uh, busy with this since February. Uh, well, actually, we had to, um, to put on pause almost everything that we were doing as a church in terms of um, during the week ministries, mostly evan- evangelism, um, because we had so many. Um, so we had literally thousands. We estimated that over 15,000 have been helped in a fo- way or another uh, since February. Um, we, we, we were sheltering people in the beginning. Uh, I've done lots of driving and brothers in the church. Um, we're helping with clothes. People, many of them left their houses with everything in, in it and just ran for their life. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of conversations just to listen to them. 
as they are pouring their hearts, their fears, and their uh, whatever they, they, it happened to them back there. Um, as the uh, wave of the people going through the border settled, uh, there are many who are staying in Chisinau and in Moldova, but mostly in Chisinau. And uh, we are currently um, having weekly meetings where we are giving food packages. And every time we're preaching the gospel, um, perhaps thousands have been through our small facility uh, confronted with the message of the gospel. And um, we're still doing this now. There are still uh, many people. Um, it, it has been difficult in terms like exhausting at times, but uh, what an encouragement to, to realize when you look back how many privileges of sharing the gospel with, with people who would previously, uh, they're also coming from Eastern Orthodox country mainly. They would not even step into the uh, facility of our evangelical church, but they came and they wanted to have conversations and thousands of Bibles and gospel tracts were given. So um, yeah, we, we have been blessed with, the, with this privilege to, to serve those in need. And we're still, it's still happening. Pray for this, for perseverance and strength. Mm. Great question. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, time is just about beating us, gents, so I'm going to let you go sit down and relax for a little bit. Um, Diego, would you give me a hand to move this across? Thanks, brother. That's brilliant. Perfect. Thank you. Well, I hope you find that an interesting and informative discussion. Thank you so much, brothers, for uh, sharing with us, for giving us a window into your work and helping us to understand the, the vital importance of discipleship and training within all of our local churches. Just now, we are going to watch a short video, uh, which is very relevant to what we've just been discussing, and it highlights the, the wonderful ministry that Moore heads up the Cornhill training course. Uh, maybe you're here today and you'd love to be better equipped to teach God's Word, whether that be within your own family, as we've been hearing about, or as a Sunday school teacher, or a youth worker, or in women's ministry, or maybe even you're considering the possibility of pastoral ministry. Well, Cornhill could be the place for you. Let's have a look at this video now. <laughs> Welcome to the Cornhill Training Course in Belfast. The course is all about pursuing excellence in handling the Word of God. It's our conviction that faithful, prayerful, expository preaching is God's chosen instrument to build Christ's church and to change lives and nations. Our primary aim is to serve the church by helping to train the preachers of the future. Alongside that, we train men and women to teach the Bible in other contexts such as youth and children's work and women's ministries. Cornhill got its name from its first location right at the heart of the city of London. In 1991, David Jackman started the course as a ministry of the Proclamation Trust. And the course began here in Belfast in 2009. The focus of the course is detailed engagement with the biblical text in an interactive context. A number of Bible books are studied in depth, along with a Bible overview and a study of the different genres. The emphasis is on teaching the Bible, teaching it both to ourselves as we sit under its authority and then teaching it to others. That means we do lots of work on talk outlines, application and communication. And then after whatever length of time... It's just been a joy coming in and being part of, of teaching young people, um, older, who are serious about engaging with God's Word, who aren't coming with the expectation that we'll be over God's Word or that they're, uh, whoever's teaching them will be over God's Word. But together we're coming under God's Word and we're hearing God speak. And that's been exciting and encouraging. In a typical week, in the mornings we usually study a particular book of the Bible or look at exposition skills. Mornings are also used for our course in Christian doctrine. In the afternoons we take something more practical, perhaps children's ministry or how to engage with culture. We often bring in visiting speakers with particular expertise, perhaps in youth work or biblical counselling. We also use afternoons for our workshops, 
This is where everything we've been learning gets put into practice. In groups of eight or nine people, course members give short presentations and then get feedback from people they know and trust. This is one of the distinctives of the course. A Cornell student will give around 20 different presentations in class. These will range from a number of short five-minute outlines to several full 20-minute Bible talks. And the Church of God throughout the world. The preaching groups have been really useful. It's one of those things where you, you don't know quite what to expect. You think you're going to say something and everyone's just going to jump on you and rip it apart. But it's, it's not like that. It's actually uh, just very useful um, to really hear what people are hearing when you preach uh, and to better just analyze it. Because at the end of the day, we want to be um, good preachers of God's word. We want his truth to be clear. And to do that, it's really useful just in the preaching class uh, to just help each other towards that goal and that end. Well, giving talks uh, in groups at the start can seem quite daunting, um, but we're all in the same boat together. Um, so the idea is not uh, to put each other down, but actually to build each other up um, and to help each other as we try to get a better handle of God's word and how to communicate that to others. The course can be taken either full or part-time. With the part-time option, members attend on Monday and Tuesday in the first year, and then Thursday and Friday in their second year. There's a really strong sense of community in the course. Every day begins with the students praying together in small groups, and it's great to witness the strong sense of gospel partnership which is cultivated each year. The community at Cornhill has really been wonderful, whether it's people from different uh, backgrounds, educationally, or uh, from different denominational backgrounds and people from across the age spectrum that hasn't really been a barrier at all to what has been a great sense of community. I hope that Cornhill will be an excellent introduction to the life of being a pastor teacher. For many it's part of a process of discerning whether they should seek to pursue full-time ministry. For a few it serves as a foundational year of training for future Christian service alongside a full-time secular job. Cornell students have already gone on to all sorts of different ministries, some to theological college to prepare for ordination, others to cross-cultural mission work overseas, a number to parachurch ministries, and a few back to their previous job after a career break. I think for me, having an interest in working with young people, um, I saw the importance of, of knowing how to teach God's Word, of wanting to learn more about it. And when I saw the Cornhill course and saw what it offered, I thought, this is, this is perfect. I hope the website and blog help introduce the course to you. But if you'd like to find out more, please do get in touch. Or perhaps you might want to arrange for a taster visit to come in and spend a day with us and chat to some of those who are currently doing the course. Better still, you could sign up for the summer school that we run in June, where over the course of a week, you get a real flavour of what the course is really all about. Well, that was a really excellent overview of what's available uh, at Cornhill. And, and let me encourage you, if you want to know more, uh, you don't have to get in touch um, with the website or anything. You can come and speak to Moore uh, this morning, this afternoon. I'm sure he would love to talk with you. We're going to shift gear just a little bit, just for a few moments, almost coffee time. But as ever, you will see that we brought with us loads of goodies on the table here. And there are lots of really good books for sale. And we want to encourage and equip you in your walk and witness for the Lord. And remember, any sales from the books today go towards the work of EMF. And to whet your appetite, I've asked Johnny Rogers, who is a PCI apprentice at First Ramara Presbyterian and super EMF supporter, to give a review on two of the great books available today. So come ahead, Johnny, and tell us about those books you've been reading. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. If you're pining for a cup of tea or a digestive biscuit, um, don't worry. I only want to take a couple of minutes to tell you about um, just some of the great books on offer at the bookstall today. Um, some of you maybe consider yourselves busy or unacademic, or perhaps you're just not a fan of reading. Um, and you might be tempted to switch off at this point. Um, but can I urge you to resist that temptation because the books that I want to tell you about are both short, they're around 80 or 90 pages in length, 
They're easy to understand, and they're well worth reading. Both are written by pastor and editor for the Gospel Coalition, um, Matt Smethurst, um, and are well recommended by people like Tim Keller um, and Glenn Scrivener. The first is about how we approach reading the Bible, and the second is about how we approach evangelism. And both books begin with the same premise, which is that how we approach things matter. For example, you might be very good in exam conditions, but if you haven't put in the preparation to revise or to study, failure is inevitable. If you are a good footballer, but you haven't warmed up before the game, you're likely to get injured or to be rusty. You might be the most, Bible, the most gifted Bible teacher here today, but if you haven't read the passage before stepping into the pulpit, it's unlikely to be insightful. And the same applies to reading the Bible and to sharing our faith. How we approach matters. And so Smethurst's focus in Before You Open Your Bible is on the posture of our hearts as we come to the scriptures. In chapter one, for example, he writes about the need to approach the Bible prayerfully. Um, and he begins with these words. I'm convinced that a prayerless approach to God's word is a major reason for the low level dissatisfaction that hums beneath the surface of our lives. And in the rest of chapter one then, he goes on to talk about four promises from the book of Psalms that we can pray as we approach God's word. Um, Promises such as Psalm 119 verse 18, um, where the psalmist prays that God would open our eyes, that we might behold wondrous things from his law. Other chapter titles from the book include Approaching Your Bible Humbly, Approaching It Joyfully, Approaching the Bible Expectantly, and Approaching the Bible Communally. Um, So this book is a bargain at $2.99, and it's in our bookstore today. The second book I wanted to tell you about um, is similar to the first, um, but this one is about preparing to evangelize. Um, And if you're like me, Um, The word evangelism may conjure up feelings of guilt um, or of fear. Guilt about opportunities, perhaps, in the past that you've missed to share the gospel. Um, And perhaps fear at the thought of trying to do so in the future and the awkward conversations that that may entail. But you'll be glad to know that the author um, not only addresses those feelings, um, but he shares them as well. This isn't a book um, to beat yourself up with because of past silence on the gospel, um, but it's a springboard into ordinary, fruitful, loving conversations about Jesus. Um, And my favorite chapter in the book was chapter three, um, which is titled, Love the Lost. Um, And this is what the author writes about themselves. The main thing holding me back from speaking the gospel wasn't actually the presence of fear, it was the absence of love. And then Smethurst goes on in the rest of the chapter to discuss how love should not only motivate our evangelism, but it should characterize it. It should not only move us to tell others about Jesus, but it should shape how we tell them about Jesus as well. And that book is also a bargain at $2.99, which is the equivalent to a takeaway coffee. And so why not skip the coffee and buy a book and learn how to approach the Bible and evangelism? Thank you. Thanks so much, Johnny, um, for that great review. As you can see at the table there, we've got a whole bunch of those books in stock. And get this, you can get one for £3.299 or two for £6. (laughs) Can't say fairer than that. There are, of course, lots of other good books there as well. Let me highlight just one more, which is a fantastic evangelistic resource. It's on the left-hand side Uh, quite a new little book, uh, Tears and Tossings. And you know, no matter how we try to sugarcoat it, there's something about suffering and loss that really shakes our confidence, that dulls the things we once enjoyed, that brings questions to the surface. The author, uh, Sarah Walton, begins this little book by sharing her own experiences of pain and suffering and Speaking personally, it was hard to read the first chapter uh, with dry eyes. But with great care and skill, she encourages her readers to put their hope in God by pointing to the man of sorrows, the one 
who captures all our tears in a bottle and who will one day wipe them dry for good. Notice it's written primarily for those unfamiliar with the Bible. So I think this is an excellent resource to share with a hurting, unbelieving friend. Uh, Why not grab a couple of copies today, make good use of them, see what the Lord will do. The price is just $2.99. The last one I'll mention very briefly is that one in the middle, five things to pray for your world. And we all know, don't we, that we ought to be praying for our world, for our community, our nation. But often when it comes to it, we don't quite know what to ask for. Or perhaps, more likely, we feel our requests to God are pretty shallow, rather repetitive We're a bit stuck in a rut. Well, this is where this super little book is designed to help. It highlights a variety of relevant topics, gives five simple suggestions for each one, which are drawn straight from the Bible. So it's a great way to invigorate and energize your prayer life and pray prayers that are in line with God's priorities. That one's normally $3.99. It's on sale for $2.99. Loads more over there. Have a little look during the break, which we're going to have now. The tea and the coffee and lots of good things are ready out there in the foyer. Um, Neil and Kathy will serve you. Uh, When you're finished, feel free to visit the literature on the table and also the books. And the toilets, should you need them, are out in the foyer to the left and to the right. And we're going to restart again at 12.40 sharp. All right, go enjoy your tea and coffee. We'll see you again soon.